Tell me a little bit about yourself and your background in IoT. Uh, my name is Monir Zak. Currently, I'm directing the Tech and Innovation Group at the U.S. Olympic Committee. I started working with IoT indirectly <clears throat> about four years ago when, uh, when we were trying to determine how do we empower athletes with better, with better decision-making tools as they were preparing for the competition at the Rio Olympic Games. So has it been, been how many years in total have you been working with athletes? With athletes, I've been working with them for about 20 years now. Um, I started my career in Italy and in Spain. Um, I used to run two uh, startups, and uh, we used to have some of the top sports brands in the world, mainly helping athletes make better decisions and helping coaches understand uh, what is the effort that an athlete is putting today on the field of play or on a skiing mountain, and help the stakeholders make uh, better decisions. So you've been at it for a little while then. What about today? So what are the technologies being used today? What are the most tech uh, popular technologies being used today in sports and in the Olympics in particular? Um, I would say wearable technology today, the, in 2017, uh, would be the top technology that's being used. Um, it's been around for three years officially, right, even though it's been in the works for the past 15 years. Um, the, the, the beauty about wearable technology, and we can also put in there um, smart fabrics and smart textiles, is that uh, you have technology on the athlete's body, so you're not really forced to take an athlete to uh, a lab or to a measurement um, it's scenario. Too. It's, it's in vitro, it's, it's real time, uh, you're not doing spot checks anymore, and most importantly, you're not, um, you're not interfering with athlete's performance, right? When you, when you take an athlete to a lab, let's say, you're already unplugging the athlete from the natural free field of play, so you're working with the best wrong data, to be honest with you, when you take them to the lab. Being able to have a soccer player or a track and field athlete or a swimmer just train or compete, and while at the same time you're picking up data points, that's, that's when the magic starts. So wearables and then, so just give us a little bit of a picture of what are you doing with the wearables? Yeah, so wearable technology, we use it almost in each and every program today and uh, within the Olympic and Paralympic sports. We use wearable technology in function of what the athletes are asking and what the coaches are asking. In some cases, we use wearable technology to determine what is the um, energy expenditure of athletes on the field of play. Other times, we want to determine what is the strategy that an athlete is following and how, and how that strategy is influencing the end result. Combined with wearable technology, we use lots of IoT. Uh, we use IoT mainly because we've got so many data points that are being generated by so many devices. Some of them are on the athlete, others are around the athlete. So we want to make sure that we're capturing all of those in one framework and we have them all synchronized in time. What would be some examples of data that's not on the athlete? Um, so let's take cycling, for example. Let's take uh, track cycling. We have got sensors on the bike, such as power meters and speed sensors. We have got sensors in the velodrome that pick up timing and they pick up video as well. We have got weather sensors and weather stations around the velodrome. And we want to make sure that all of these are tied into the same framework as the heart rate data, the breathing data, the oxygen levels in the muscles, and then we can build some artificial intelligence on top of that. Okay, well talk to us a little bit about the artificial intelligence. How is that used? Um, we, we use artificial intelligence mainly to answer questions coming out from the coaches. You know, at the U.S. Olympic Committee, we made a very wise decision about four years ago to follow problem-driven um, projects. We used to work a lot um, some years ago with technology and we used to do lots of research, but then we, f we discovered that we were putting lots and lots of time on the tech and on the science and not as much time determining what is the problem that we're trying to solve for, right? So it's as if we were finding lots of hammers and then looking for where, where the nail is. Today, we are very focused on, on problems. We use artificial intelligence to come up with answers for, uh, for the coaches. And we use artificial intelligence quite a lot to discover some new surprises in, in the data sets. You know, um, sometimes we have coaches who don't necessarily um, have the knowledge that certain questions could be formulated. So then that those questions never make it to the, to the list, right? But then through inside the data, we start finding some, some, some neat correlations. And then we throw these back at the coach. Say, hey, coach, what do you think? And then she'd say, wow, is this even possible today? So I, I can understand using the AI to identify patterns and so forth in the data itself, but how are you using the AI to answer questions? That's the first thing. Yeah. So let's, let's take uh, track cycling again. In track cycling, you have got um, one of the uh, programs is called Team Pursuit. Four athletes, right, they start in a row, and these athletes have to cross the finish line before the other team crosses the finish line. 
Um, questions such as, how do you choose your athletes among the available athletes that you have? What is the strategy that you use? Who starts first, second, third, and fourth? Within, uh, within a competition, athletes would be switching because the leading athlete is exerting 40% more power with respect to the pack. So she would, be, she would put an effort for about two laps at most and then she has to drop back. So when do you have her drop back? Is it after a lap? Is it after a lap and a, and a half? So once we determine the mathematical model of the physiological state of the body, we determine what is the outcome that we want to achieve, and then we run artificial intelligence to help us answer the question. Right? Who are the athletes who need to be on the, on the velodrome today? What is the starting order? What is the switching? No, that, makes, that makes sense. And then, so it's almost like macro questions for the coach. And then the other, the other way you use artificial intelligence, as you were saying, is to, to find, identify patterns in data at mm -hmm. a more micro level. I mean, give us an example of that one. Okay, so and with artificial intelligence, we had, um, we had a, a big question coming in from our diving team. Right. And diving, it's, it's a program that we call a decentralized program. It's, uh, we have athletes all around the, the country. And in diving, you have got a discipline called synchronized diving. You've got two athletes diving at the same time. Right? How do you pick your synchronized pair? You are physically able to bring the athletes together two, three, four times a year maybe. But then all of a sudden you have got 20 athletes and you have to figure out what is the right combination. There's no physical way. There's no human way to do that and experiment with that in a feasible manner. So what we ended up doing over the past years was develop a wearable technology solution uh, along with some partners that our divers could use no matter where they are in the US. They would dive. When they dive, we'd have their data points uh, shooting up to a server and then we would have a matchmaking algorithm, let's say running, that would then float the best pairs of divers and would sync the worst pairs of divers and would put that in front of the coaches. And then the coaches would make their, their, their best call, right? Say, are we going to trust the algorithm and, and give it a try? Are we not going to trust it? But this is where, where the beauty of coaching comes in, right? And any coach would tell you that the, the best coach is the one who finds the best equilibrium between the art of coaching and the science of coaching. Yeah. Now, you're mentioning wearables, and I understand, you know, the, obviously the value in using the wearables during training. Mm -hmm. Now, what about during the performance or during the actual competition? Maybe it's going to depend on the sport, but are they able to use the wearables at that time? Yeah, during competition, we have to look at what the regulations say. Some sports, they allow it. Uh, tennis, um, cycling. Um, some, sometimes they allow the use of the technology, but they don't allow the use of utilizing the technology for real-time uh, feedback, right? So cycling, for example, we have cyclists who have been carrying their heart rate monitors and their power meters on their bikes for tens and tens of years, right? But in cycling, when you are competing, you cannot have a two-way communication between a coach and an athlete. So even though technologically you're able to push and pull data and relay information, you would not do that in a competition setting. In other sports, uh, the wearable technology is, is not allowed. Sometimes it's not allowed for safety reasons. Let's think of um, combat sports. Sometimes it's not allowed because the uh, regulating body did not pick up the importance of using wearable technology. Now, I'm a firm believer in technology. I've been working in technology and sports for many years. I think it's just a question of time. You know, sooner or later, all sports will be uh, digitized, all sports will be turned on, and wearable technology will and should make its way into all the sports. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and I think the only reason that will probably happen is from a viewer experience, you can, you can show a lot of interesting data, even this past Olympics, I remember fencing, which isn't necessarily the, well, at least for me, it's not the most interesting sport. However, when they started using the wearables and then the IoT technology to identify when strikes were happening, I think even where strikes were happening, it became pretty visually interesting. And so that could be another reason why they may allow it. I agree with you 100%. You know, there is, there is usually a gap between what athletes go through and what viewers are experiencing you know, at the comfort of their sofa. Uh, let's, take, um, let's take shooting, for example, right? So shooting is one of those sports where you don't understand why it is a sport. You don't understand what the athletes are going through unless you are a fanatic of that sport, unless you really have experienced it, have done it, or know someone who, who competes in that discipline. Um, if you talk to any shooter, they would tell you that that is the most stressful sport that they've ever done in their lives. As a matter of fact, sometimes when they are in the shooting range and they're like focusing and trying to, you know, pull the trigger at the right moment to hit the target, they have got their heartbeat shooting up to 160, 180 sometimes, right? 
when you're at TV, uh, watching it from TV, you're just sitting there wondering, what, what are they doing, right? Just, just shoot uh, the, the gun, right? And this gap could be addressed by technology. You know, if we are able to transfer what athletes go through to the commentators who are going to be enriching their language at that point and commentating on you know, what the, what's happening with the athlete and transfer that knowledge to everyone who's watching that sport, there where I believe you are going to get way more engaged fans and you're going to have more visibility around the sport. Yeah, I think that's interesting even if you just display their heart rate while they're able. Yeah. All right, Munir, thank you. Uh, where can people find out more about you and, um, and your businesses? Uh, people can find out about me on my LinkedIn profile. That would be my most uh, up-to-date uh, profile. Um, you can also look me up on um, teamusa.org, and you can also look me up at the Innovation Launchpad. Innovation Launchpad. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.